Hello Tank fans, welcome to Totally Tanked and I'm Rob and I'm here with... Hello, my name is John. And we're talking about the Arjun Indian main battle tank today and it's the 5th of December and this is episode 25 of Totally Tanked. 5th of December 2021 for the uh, folks who will come to this years in the future as as we've discovered some of our oldest podcasts are almost listened to um, every month so that's... That's awesome. Um, so, yes, the tank we're doing is the um, Arjun, um, which is an Indian tank, and it's never seen any combat. And um, so that's the end of the story. Yeah, we're done? I think so. I hope so. Yeah, cool. Well, <laughs> there is a little bit more to the story. There's more you to the have. story. And look, there will be some people who disagree with our uh, assessment of this tank, but um, if, I think if they have a hard, deep look into their hearts and minds, they might see that we have some valid points. Look, I think the important thing to stress right from the start is that uh, we are coming to this from a place of every tank's, every country's first tank is got some issues and mostly is really bad. Uh, and every country has problems with defence procurement programs, particularly when they're trying to do something original. Um, and these aren't unique problems just to Indians because they're Indians. These are problems of anyone trying to do these things. And also, we are probably going to have to touch on how there are problems with corruption in Indian defence procurement. But I would say there are problems with corruption in everyone's defence procurement because there's lots of things that are secret and there's lots of money. And when you combine those two things, some individuals are going to take advantage of that. Uh, And India has had some really big scandals, but they've also caught some people, which is more than you can say for some other countries. (laughs) So having got that out of the way, we're not anti-Indian. We don't, you know, we think there are even some good things about the Arjun tank and we're going to talk about those. But we think that any fair and reasonable assessment of this tank is going to cover the fact that it's got some issues. <laughs> yeah, a few. Just a few. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what is the Arjun, Rob? Well, it's a main battle tank. Uh, design, first designed, uh, well, so the concept was put forward in 1974 uh, by because they found the Centurions didn't like the 50 degree heat in the Rajasthani desert. Uh, also, apologies for any mispronunciations we have for any name. I think you're okay with Rajasthan. But well, yeah. I'm just going to say that uh, try and speak for uh, um, uh, place names and uh, other words with too many syllables for me uh, is going to be difficult. But anyway, we'll keep going. Um, yep. So... The idea was in the 70s. The design uh, happened in the 80s. The prototypes happened in the 90s. The production happened in the 2000s and an into service in, 20, in the 2010s. Um, and then it very quickly got grounded because they didn't have a lack of parts. Uh, but yeah. they fixed some of those. Anyway. So, so, I mean, just looking through some of the design timelines, the official design process was 83 to 96. And then production didn't start until 2004. And as of 2021, 141 have been built. And that indicates a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's a long time. And there were a lot of changes in the India. So you got three. So it, let's let's just go back to one point. It is a fifty-eight ton, sixty-two ton, depending on how 68 much. Sixty-eight ton. No, no, that's the Mark One. So we're talking. Mm. Sorry, Mark One A. So mm. we've got the two versions. So we've got the Mark One. Yep. Which is the one that's in service now, and they've just gone out and signed the deal to buy another hundred and eighteen. Mark 1As, which we're going to be the Mark 2, but they mm. changed the name to Mark 1As. Mm. So we'll talk about the Mark 1s a little bit. They're the ones that are in service now. So they're a 58, 62 ton type tank, depending on what you've got on it. Um, MBT, 120 mil rifled barrel uh, gun. So in order to fire hash rounds. Now let's... Just like the POMs and their challenges. Yeah, let's quickly talk about that because the thing to remember with any discussion of the Arjun is that India is one of the world's biggest operators of T-72s and T-90s, which means they're also one of the world's biggest operators of 125mm smoothbore cannon. And somehow, with that excellent cannon deployed in thousands of tanks, they've gone with what seems like a retrograde step with um, going for a... Because the trouble with rifled cannons is um, they wear out faster. Uh, and for armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabo rounds, they're not as good. Hmm. Um, because they put the spin on it, which means they don't uh, penetrate as well. But they really Well, they lose muzzle velocity as yeah. well. Rifle, rifling loses your muzzle hmm. velocity, and you just don't need the spin of the rifling for most modern tank music, munitions. But the hash rounds, it does, yes. does need it, and they can fire more accurate with hash rounds over longer range. Yeah. But so that, that's hash... high-explosive squashed head, which against homogenous steel 
armor is very good at creating spalling on the inside of the tank. So which, the T-55s. Yeah, so, and spalling does sound like um, something that's a bit cute, but when a steel blister forms on the inside of your tank and then showers the inside of the tank with um, red-hot supersonic uh, metal, you're mostly dead. It's not even a bad day. You just mm. don't exist anymore. Yeah. Pink um, mist is all through the inside of the tank. But yeah. Anyway, so we've got that. We've got... Um, um, They've got a, it's got a uh, external machine gun for 12.72, 12.7, 12. Yeah, 50 7, cal to 50 the cal. old money, but yeah. yeah. Uh, gun on the outside, they've got um, 762 uh, coax gun. They, um, it's 1400 uh, horsepower engine. It can do up to 70 k's an hour on track. <laughs> Down a coal mine. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> it's 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 like I tell you what some of the videos one of the videos I did like was uh, seeing this tank uh, ripping along the road with about thirty uh, civilians who'd obviously come along for a bit of a tank open day and they'd thrown them on the outside of the tank and they're just roaring down the road. Hang on, lads! Yeah. <laughs> they didn't find it. They, they all look like they have a mm-hmm. great outside. I'd be, be awesome. having the, I'd be having the best day of my life. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yes. um, but then there's the Mark One A, which says. Um, just been signed an audit a deal has just been signed for by the Indian Army to purchase another 118 of uh, the new tanks. They're going to be a 68 ton behemoth. Uh, it's only going to do uh, 58 k's an hour, um, and it's going to cost around nine and a half million dollars, which is the equivalent of your clerks type thing. So it does put it into most expensive tank in the world territory. Yeah, well, yeah, it's up, it's right up there. Um, and for India, that's mm-hmm particularly a lot and again when you're the world's largest operator of the t90 and you're very happy with the t90 Mm -hmm. i you can imagine the fights in the corridors of power in new delhi uh about um who exactly decided to spend all this money on a worse tank uh just because it's locally produced but i'm gonna take a step back there and say that if you are the indian army and you don't actually have to pay the bills on any of this stuff, then, yeah, it's like, let's go buy the tanks from our friends, the Russians, who uh, make a tank that we know how to use and know how to service, and let's just keep doing that. If you're the Indian government, you might well say, it will cost us more this year to develop a uh, locally made tank, but in a 100 years' time, uh, having an indigenous tank design and construction capability is going to give us better tanks and the money's going to stay at home. Even if it costs more, you, the fact is it's still paying for, you know, uh, local people to um, sell lunch to the people who make the tanks and, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the flow the, on effects in the economy. One of the big selling points for the Mark 1A and the this new order is that it's going to provide 8,000 jobs actually on the line of building these things. So, again, you're going to take three times that many people uh, supporting that at least. Yeah, I think you've got real problems with your tank production line if... Well, 8,000 people are doing yeah. what one German robot should be doing. But, um, <laughs> I, it'll be all the bits and pieces go with it. From sure. Design, yeah. yeah, I hear you. But at the same time, geez, that's... I know. That's, that's, that's um, one of the selling points, though. So mm. just remember this. So, all right, let's get into the idea of having an indigenous uh, uh, tank building capability. For that... These, uh, for the idea of having an indigenous tank building capability for a country is a that has uh, border issues and it is under threat from uh, enemies or uh, people. Well, let's let's remember India has fought major wars in living memory against China and Pakistan, uh, and um, has also had major civil wars being fought adjacent to it in uh, Bangladesh, um, and um, you know Nepal and. Um, in particular, Nepal, but, you know, Bhutan, um, everyone apparently there is super happy, but you... Anyway, <laughs> Nepal is definitely unstable. Uh, and also, India has huge insurgencies that we never hear about. Mm. Uh, the, you know, Nagaland and um, the Naxalites. Um, Naxalites sound like they should be Doctor Who villains, but in fact, they're a um, Marxist insurgency raging in, um, in India. There you go. Um, Look, it's a big country with a huge, diverse population. And of... huge, diverse terrain. It's yeah. It's... It, it is a world unto itself, yeah. particularly for Australians, but even our American friends, it is hard to comprehend just how big and varied. I think there's a, something like a thousand languages spoken in India. It, um, it's a big, 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 big place. Um, yeah. and, and everything's, everything's different. There's no, you can't just say, lob it all into one and say, this is India. No, it's, it's all 
big different place. Mm. So, look, and I understand all that, and so put that into perspective for, for a lot of things. So, of, um, but our Arjun is basically settled in uh, Rajasthan and probably won't be moving out anytime soon. Okay, now Rajasthan is a landscape of um, yeah, again, Desert. it's it's a big it's a big place mm. in its own right, and I'm sure there are green fields just like Australia mm. isn't all sandy desert um, either. Um, but you know, Rajasthan you, you mean is like the great sandy desert. Yeah. yeah. Rajasthan and, and the little sandy desert. Yeah. Rajasthan <laughs> and is the great m- stony desert. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Rajasthan is mostly known for its enormous sand dunes. Uh, and this is where a really hefty tank, um, with an engine that is noted for being bad in dry, sandy conditions, um, is going to have some problems because ground pressure is everything when you're trying to maneuver on sand. Uh, and if your your ground pressure is high, then your tank is just going to spin its tracks and dig a hole for itself. Um, which is why they love the T ninety, which is one of the lightest main battle tanks out there, mm. um, despite having the biggest gun and the heaviest armor. Go, go on, your Russians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's where they've deployed them to Rajasthan. Um, now, when someone pointed out to me that it seems weird for a country that um, operates as many 125 mil smooth bores as they do to go for 120 millimeter uh, rifled design, which only has an advantage in Hesh, I immediately thought they must have identified a weakness in Pakistani and Chinese armor to Hesh rounds, because that's the only reason you'd do it. The Hesh rounds are also cheaper. Mm, yeah, okay, there's that. But it also turns out that the composite armour that Pakistan is using on its Al-Khalid tanks, who, Lord knows, we'll get there one day, um, is more like homogenous steel than composite. Um, so it is entirely possible that they do, in fact, have a problem with Hesh ammunition um, with the Pakistani tanks and possibly with the Chinese uh, ones as well. Um, but... That's a very dangerous thing to bank on because armor packages on tanks can change yeah. um, in a year. Yeah, and it's just a case of finding some ERA, slapping on the new stuff, and away you go. Yeah, uh, whereas as we've discussed with the the, the British troubles um, with the Challenger series, ammunition types once they go into production, it can take forty years to turn that bus around. Um, and if um, the enemies put a uh, armor package on that um, obsoletes it, then uh, you've you've got a real problem with trying to regun your tanks if you have to. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that appears to be... That's pure speculation on my part, but I would say reasonably well-informed speculation. Mm. They definitely have felt a burning need to have uh, high-explosive squashed head ammunition. And given that there might be a weakness in uh, the Pakistani composites to it, then that makes some sense. That is... That- that's the only thing I can think of besides the being cheaper. So, mm. but yeah, no, it's good. Good do, point. Do we want to run through the astonishing number of ammunition types that the um, go for it? So <laughs> we've got Lahat, <clears throat> which they, again they had, uh, which is the Israeli produced um, anti tank missile that you shoot down the barrel. But they yes. had is- issues with uh, pl- uh, getting that in- into production. Uh, because they can't, they tried it out and it cancelled the order for the electronics package and all sorts of other fun mm-hmm. stuff. But they might have recently fixed that problem, I think. Mm. And then you've got Samho. Don't know that one. Samho's the Indi- Indian produced um, anti tank guided missile. Right. Um, now, this one is, to my mind, a really classic example of really um, off the rails defense procurement because it is, on the one hand, Rifled guns aren't great for firing missiles out of, certainly not compared to larger diameter smooth, smooth bores. Um, but they've developed this uh, anti-tank missile, the SAMHO, S-A-M-H-O. Um, it's got a tandem warhead for penetrating um, tank armor. So, you know, you, mm. the first warhead sets off the explosive reactive armor or dents the composite or whatever. And then a follow-up um, explosive comes in and hopefully actually gets inside the tank. Um, and this is a very specialized munition for dealing with tanks, which sit on the ground and move at no more than 70 kilometers an hour. And then they've tried to shoehorn onto the top of it and anti-helicopter capability <laughs> and helicopters, even w- comparatively well armored helicopters are not well armored in tank terms. No. Uh, and just, they you move. Need, you just need frag. Yeah, and they move. Yeah, you just need a fragmentation round. Yeah. Um, and um, to, to hit somewhere within a hundred meters of it. Yeah, exactly. No, sorry, to go off somewhere within a hundred meters of yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah, so so the things you need for an anti-helicopter round are so radically different to what you need in an anti-tank round. I, I question whether it was a good idea to try and combine the two capabilities in um, one, one vehicle. One. I also question trying to use tanks for anti-aircraft work because they're just designed fundamentally to do different things and you're mm. better off bringing a dedicated anti-aircraft asset if you're dealing with helicopters. Or fast jets. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah, I would say for fast jets you need a very dedicated capability. But... No, I'm saying fast jets to take out the helicopters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Think. Yes, in, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, <laughs> and superiority is what you want. To yeah, you much, much, <laughs> much better to um, pay for the pilots and have some air superiority. So anyway, that's Samho, and then we've got Heat, so your good old high-explosive anti-tank, which is your shape charge. Armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo. Now, now, they are making this one indigenously, So, mm-hmm. and if you compare the size of it to the size of what the POMs are using in their uh, rifle version, mm-hmm. it's about half the size, so it's going to get much less penetration than mm. the uh, what other countries are using in their AP, AFP, SD, ST, UC, like whatever. Yeah. Um, A but, lot of people now, admittedly, not anyone who would know what they're talking about, because it's part of the trouble with talking about this is, A, most of the sources aren't in English, and the sources that are telling lies. So, you know, take everything that we've learned with the, some big grains of salt. Um, the new version mm. uh, for the Mark 1A, mm-hmm. they, they are, have redeveloped the ammunition for it, and so it'll be as much better uh, penetration and much improved uh, round. But the existing ones they had for the Mark 1s uh, weren't as good. Okay. Moving on, though, because we have more ammunition types. So we got your high explosive squashed head, which would appear to be the only reason why you go with a rifled gun is to have this capability. And then you've got to ask, what is that going to achieve that you couldn't do? Also good for taking out concrete bunkers. Yes. Um, I don't know if Pakistan is is, is known for having concrete bunkers on its borders. Yeah, but you can also use uh, dedicated demolition rounds uh, for that. And and they don't need... Because demolition rounds don't need to be fired out of tank um, guns anyway. Because the speed and, requirements are very different. And, and it's not like the bunkers are moving around that you have to have the accuracy that uh, your rifle barrel provides you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like literally, um, you know, the, um, what was that? That Churchill variant that fired the um, the flying the one, dustbin. Yeah, the 162 or something? Yeah, which was a spigot mortar with basically yeah. a garbage bin full of high explosives mm-hmm. that it just lobbed gently into the a, um, target. The RE or something like that? Yeah. yeah. It was the, the, the engineering um, uh, vehicles usually have yeah. these sort of activity um, rounds on them. But... Yeah, again, the point stands that Hesh is not actually a necessarily is, ideal use. No, but it does do the job for bunkers. Yeah, because it goes splat on the outside mm. of the concrete and um, the inside of the concrete turns everything inside to pink yeah. mist again. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, and then we have... Uh, this is going to lose us our clean rating. So, the um, penetration cum blast. <laughs> now, Tell us more, John. Tell yeah. us more. <laughs> Now, it's been pointed out to me that, I mean, you know, in conventional English, um, the word come will often be used in, as a substitute for with. Um, so this is a penetration round that also creates a blast. And I've struggled to find a source in English that actually explains what's going on here. There is a suggestion this is also a thermobaric round, um, which again is not something I'd actually want to launch out of a, um, a tank rifle. But... Um, so the idea is that it has a semi-armor piercing capability to get inside enemy vehicles, particularly the more soft-skinned ones, and then it creates a fuel air bomb inside the vehicle, and then it goes kaboom. Right. Um, yes, which would be a bad day. On the other hand, once you penetrate the vehicle, quite a small amount of high explosive will also do that without um, the need for the more complicated fuel air interaction. And I, the Russians do have a vehicle called the TOS-1, um, which is a... Um, built on, I think, the T-90 chassis or, or T-72, something like that, and it fires some quite large uh, missiles out of big racks, and they've got big thermobaric um, rounds, which is sort of like an advance on napalm, and I've seen video of them um, shelling a Syrian hillside, and it, it looks like hell on earth. Um, but that's big thermobaric rounds, not small ones crammed into 120 millimeter packages. Um, anyway, so that's what's going on with the penetration cum blast um thank you india for giving the world a um giggle with that naming um not, not that there's anything funny about that is there rob no no not at all no at all. Um, so all around it, okay so that's a lot of ammunition types mm. more than just your uh, 
heat or, uh, or um, um, armor piercing uh, or high explosives is yeah. really the only question most tank commanders <laughs> want to answer. And it, it or smoke. <laughs> yeah, it carries 42 rounds, um, and I don't know, is now when we talk about the advantage of their containerization versus blast doors? There is look, um, there lots of discussion of whether or not their containerization is effective. Um, and again, this is uh, something that has been looked at on the internet quite a lot and lots of people. Lots having... of people shouting at each other a lot about this But subject. they came together in the end, is the main thing. Did you see the... Oh, the did Alpha Defense and, Defense and Red Effect yes. finally yes. bury Ma- the hatchet? Maximus, and I'd like to give a shout out to Maximus for bringing this discussion to a mm. very useful... Uh, and for those who don't know, go on to... Uh, no, don't. You... <laughs> don't waste your time on anyway, this argument. <laughs> anyway, but the uh, two people, the two people in, uh, came together and had a really good discussion about uh, the strengths and, and uh, strengths and weaknesses of the Adrian and mm. what it was good at and what it wasn't. So, so and the, that was that was really good. that was very well done by the uh, online tank community. I'm mm. really proud of uh, everybody for doing. Good that. on your tanky community. <laughs> um, now, so the issue at heart is that the um, Indian system has 42 sealed tubes. Um, which in theory stops a um, penetrating conflagration spreading amongst the ammunition. So if a round goes off in in these uh, little containers, it's not going to kill everybody inside the uh, turret. Uh, Yeah, I mean, the issue, of course, is that if you've got a penetration into your ammo storage area, then a a whole bunch of systems are broken and failing. Mm. And and what happens? And this is versus the uh, more usual system where you have a great big blast door and when the as long as the blast door is closed, then the blowout panels will mean that if the ammunition cooks off it, explodes out outwards and doesn't kill um, your crew and there is an issue with the individual sealed 42 little containers for each round is that the gunner needs to keep track of which of the containers still has a useful round in it and mm. um, which ones don't uh, but it's basically creating 42 little blast doors instead of one great big blast door yeah and you've got to say whether or not that is going to be just as effective to have um, that tiny little blast door versus a nice big thick Automatic uh, steel. Well, I would say that small blast doors can be tougher than big blast doors. So it does have that going in its favour. But it it strikes me as a a workable solution to the problem, but possibly not the best solution to the problem. No, I agree. It's... (laughs) Yep. Okay, <laughs> moving on. What else do we want to talk about with the Arjun, Rob? Oh, look. Um, I looked at this tank and I said, and I watched a lot of the uh, videos on YouTube about it, and it came across as anything coming out from the Indian Ministry of Defence and um, uh, over there was very much a propaganda video. And there were selling points of the tank of it has four highly trained crew members it has can go 70 k's now it has armor it has a gun it does all these things and it really was just a case of for somebody who's looked at other tanks and mm. you just they're trying to sell all these points of uh of how exciting and incredible it is but it's like saying yep it's a tank but compared to all the other tanks around it that, that are going like that it's the same. Um, there, there are no real differences, but they're trying to sell them up as um, anybody who's looked at a car, yes, you'd be really impressed with this tank because you're comparing the car. But if you're comparing that tank to other tanks, then it's pretty much very similar. But uh, it's when you start looking at the logistics behind it and the procurement process and how long it took to bring into production and the support that goes with it, you say, well, actually, it's not as good as all these other ones that do pretty much the same stuff but have a better support system. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the um, Indian material on the subject, be it Indian newspapers or directly Indian government sites, um, you know, it's like, oh, it's got wheels. Um, or, pretty, you know, oh, it. look, it's got the turret. Um, yeah. You know, um, say, oh, it's got highly trained crew members. Well, you know, the, the training level of the crew members is different to the design of the tank. They're not really uh, related issues. Mm. Um, and, I mean, I've got to say, the, the early model Arjun looked to me... I mean, I know technically everyone says it looks like a Leopard 2A4. It looked to me a lot like a Tiger. It looked to me so much like a Tiger <laughs> that someone said, you know what's cool? Tigers, let's build one of those. <laughs> um, that would explain a lot. So yeah, it's look- very slab-sided. It's very blocky. It's very vertical um, when mm. most modern tanks try and be angular. Mm. Um And then they've um, stuck, now they've stuck on the 1A a lot of... Um, 
there's a lot of argument about what's in them. But anyway, basically, similar to actually what the Germans did do with their later, later Leopard 2 models, uh, adding a lot of um, spacing um, mm. and, uh, and wedges um, onto it, creating that angled look. Um, and, I mean, if you look at the field test of how the um, Turkish forces did in the Syrian Civil War, their Leopard 2s got blown up and their M1s got blown up, and it's really hard to say if there's a qualitative difference between the, the two approaches to armour, mm. uh, at least in the export models. Look, and it, they, they've with the ERA that they've put on it, it's, uh, they have developed their own uh, indigenous... So it's got Ira, Nira, and Kanchan. Um. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, this is the Mark 1As. The yeah. uh, Mark 1s only have the uh, Kanchan, I think. Mm. Um, uh, again, an indigenous capability. Uh, so they've built that and uh, putting it in place themselves. Um, look, it's... Um, there's a big difference. Uh, there's a lot of combat between the Ministry of Defence, the Indian Army, and the development uh, organisation, DRDO. Mm. And so the Army does not want these tanks. Um, the MOD wants the propaganda and to have an Indigenous capability because that's basically part of their government function. Uh, government drive is to build things Indigenously and to have that capability within India. And the problem is the DRDO can't build what the Army is requesting. So that's why there's, it's not a collaborative effort. It's a very combative effort from what I can read and see of the development of this tank, uh, of putting those, all these three together, saying the army keeps changing. Everybody keeps saying the army keeps changing their mind as to what they want. Yeah, the army why, doesn't want it. Yeah. Which, which <laughs> full why the full army, stop. That's <laughs> why the army doesn't want it. So they probably, it's probably proud of it. Mm. Um, uh, it's just... For 46 years, or whatever it's, 47 years that, that this thing's been in, uh, had a thought bubble around it and it still have not come up with a um, something good. Like We can say, you were saying before that uh, the Arjun is a modern tank that would have been good in 1990. Yeah, but they're um, building it in 2021 yeah. and, and things have moved on. Yeah. Um, like, do things like, you know, having an electro slag recovery... Um, Barrel, which is like the identical technology to what the British used to build um, Challenger twos, um, yeah, it was that was totally a, a state of the art thing in nineteen ninety. But um, everyone has decided that smooth bores are better. Mm. Um, yeah, even the British have finally given up on their on their <laughs> rifled uh, barrels. But 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 here we have because there's over long development process a tank rolling off production lines as a as as a new tank with a weapon that that's thirty years out of date. Um, I also reckon they've lowballed the uh, design funding because um, certainly the numbers I'm looking at that um, you know to 1995 they spent 206 million dollars um, US. Um, I know that labor costs in India are um, much lower than uh, most other places that are trying to build tanks, but if someone is actually an expert in composite armor they have a price on the world market and can go and get jobs in lots of other countries. Yeah. Uh, and it's not like Indians are uh, backwards in um, mm-hmm. heading yeah. out, heading heading far afield in search of wealth, just like lots of other people, lots of Australians do it too. Yep. Um, but I, yeah, I'm just saying that, that an Indian who actually has the skills um, to do what's needed here is not going to be cheap um, just because other labour in India is often too cheap. Um and the, 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 the numbers that I'm, I can see about how much they've actually spent on this development process are just really low. You would, you would have expected these numbers to be in the billions, not the hundreds of millions. Mm. Um, and I, I think that's part of why it's taken them so long to do these things. And you've got to understand the capabilities that you need to build. You know, you need to build test firing ranges. You need to... Um, you know, just the metallurgy, and then then you start getting into composite uh, armor, and you know you, you've got to have the uh, materials um, scientists to to make the composites and then layer them correctly, and uh, all of this stuff takes lots and lots of time and lots and lots of money and lots and lots of patience, and once you've got them in place, then you can you know move these processes through much faster. Um, but I, I do think that a part of what's held them back is simply trying to start all this stuff. Um, yeah, in one go. But it comes back to this is a tank that is far too heavy for operating in India. Yep. Um, it's got too small a gun. It's got too unreliable an engine. 
Um, and then you've got the biggest problem from the Indian point of view in that at the end of the process, they say, okay, and how much of this tank is actually built here? About 20%. I think it's 69. Mm, the number I've seen is that it's 80% foreign, but it's, yeah. I'm sure that varies depending yeah. on the... the depending and, on the components and yeah. parts we're talking about. But fundamentally, if you want to build good tanks, you've got to be able to build a good engine. Now, building good tanks... Part of the issue with this uh, drive towards building indig- and di- having an indigenous tank building capability within India, all right, when they came up with it, I thought to myself, and I first looked at this and said, yep, having an indigenous tank building capability within the country is a good long-term plan. They should work towards that and then they can do something and keep going for however long. And then I realized, hang on a second, they've been building T-72s in India since 1983. So, under license, they were the first country outside of the Warsaw well, Communist Pact uh, to stick their hand up and say, um, t- due to change of governments in the 70s, um, the government said, we're not just going to look at uh, uh, Western tanks when we're looking at uh, and, and new tanks, we're going to look at the Russians. And the Russians jumped on board that and said, right, we've got a new market uh, that's not just a, uh, our puppet states, we're going to sell, um, sell um, tanks to this other country. And uh, so they go. India got a good price, and they're actually built. They've been building tanks in India since the early eighties. Uh, these T seventy twos, and they've been rocking them out um, all that time. So they have a build capability. They've already got the capability to build tanks. They're building. They've been building T seventy twos for forty years. I'd, I'd need to know more about exactly what they're building because you know Australia has assembled um, F eighteen Hornets in this country, mm. but Don't we could. We have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we said we did some assembly, mm-hmm. um, but uh, we could no sooner design or build from scratch a um, first line fighter aircraft than fly to the moon. Like yeah. literally, that they would be comparable tasks yeah. for this country. Oh I mean, yeah, uh, <laughs> India was building the T seventy twos under license from the Russians, mm. and um, but the thing is, they've got two thousand T seventy twos still rocking around the, around India, and that is their main staple um, MBT. They've also got T nineties, but they're kind of the same tank. It's, yeah, no, uh, basically T seventy twos is the T nineties is the upgraded T seventy twos. But um, seriously, is they've had this tank building capability within the country? Yes, building their own version. Um, it seems strange that they've got basically, and the uh, the Arjun is pretty much a. Uh, very much modelled on the on the Leopard twos. Mm. So the fact that they've had, except they went for the crappier version of the engine. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Again, all those sort of things. So the choices you got to think. Uh, okay, you wanting to build a, um, an indigenous tank building capability, but you've already got one. Mm. Um, well, they've they've obviously very much gone for not Soviet or not Russian mm. in their. Uh, I mean, when they started the project, it was not Soviet. This is how long the project's been going. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, an alternative... So it, it's it's all these um, mostly Western European um, components getting um, crammed together in this tank. But someone's made a conscious decision that instead of working with the Russians... Um, and could well be the Russians didn't want to help the Indians develop their own um, tank production capability because they'd rather keep them as customers. Mm. Um, but uh, just so much of this is... Um, basically re-engineering, uh, reverse engineering a Leopard 2. Yeah. Only um, they've made a porky one with a worse gun. <laughs> and, and, and a bad but, engine. But you've got to think, you've got to, you've got to, I, I was questioning that at the time uh, when I was writing up my notes for this saying, well, was this flip-flopping between, um, uh, during the Cold War, and this was all happening during the Cold War in the 80s, and 70s mm. and 80s, um, was this flip-flopping between uh, the West and the USSR did that was that detrimental in their capabilities that they wanted to develop because they weren't getting the support because because they were buying building T72s and buying T72s that the, the west said well you're not uh, really um, serious about us so we're not actually going to provide you the support to build uh, leopard 2s or whatever else uh, i don't know uh, but i'm just wondering if that politicalization of the situation said Yep, you've gone this way, so we're no longer going to uh, help you help you guys out uh, with your design and uh, with what you want to do for building your own version, or is it just uh, keeping their own secrets to themselves until they, the Indians want to come along and license properly license uh, Leopard Twos? I mean, it's worth remembering that India pioneered the um, non-aligned nations uh, movement, which um, 
sounds in many ways like a good idea when you've got the, yeah. the Soviets wanting to end the world and the the Western alliance wanting to um, fight them and then just a whole bunch of countries saying, no, we're checking out of this madness. Mm. Um, so I, I have a lot of um, sympathy for that, but the trouble with being in the non-aligned camp is it, it definitely made it hard to um, get um, the best defence gear because um, you weren't tapping into either of those packs, although you know, the Indians did do a great deal with the Russians, which... Um, yeah, they so they love their T90s, so that uh, that is something. Mm-hmm. Um, Look. It was, I, I think, what I, my sense is that just the design process was so glacially slow and they kept locking in various components. And when you're doing design process, you have to do that. Yeah. Um, but they kept locking, you know, the 120 millimeter. It started um, out as 105. Sorry? It started out as a 105 rifle gun. Yeah, well, I mean, the L7 back in the 70s was the um, yeah. the, 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 the reference gun. gun. Yeah. yeah. Um, sure, but, you know, and then, and then the, the MTU diesel engine they chose, which doesn't like the conditions it's supposed to operate in. Um, so the MTU MB838, um, which is notionally a 1,400 horsepower um, liquid-cooled turbocharged diesel. And 1,400 horsepower should be enough, um, but it doesn't help when your tank keeps... Um, gaining weight, uh, <laughs> like me over COVID. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but besides that, uh, like the Mark One A is supposed to be going to a fifteen hundred horsepower and a better uh, auxiliary power unit, so that uh, if they're not um, running the main power pack, it can still have all its uh, electronics up and do all the things that modern tanks do. And uh, which is look, it's a decent modern tank, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not groundbreaking. It's not great. It's just. Yeah, it's a decent modern tank from 30 years ago. Now, you, you've also got just got an issue that it's impossible until this thing actually goes to war for us to say, is the Indian um, combat software, the fire control software, the combat management mm. software, is it actually any good? Um, and this they, is... They've now got to make sure it, it works in over 50 degrees heat. So uh, that That's was, a start. That, that was yeah. Especially when it's deployed to a desert where mm. it quite often does go over 50 degrees. So Yes. Hmm. They fixed that bit. Yep. Yeah, I mean, important things to fix. Um, but it's... it's For any country, the, the robustness of the software in the military hardware is becoming more and more of an, an issue, and no one is good at managing it. I mean, the problems the Americans have had with the Joint mm-hmm. Strike Fighter with its uh, millions and millions of lines of um, poorly written code. Um, but it's also one of those things that when the day comes and the update arrives, suddenly a dog of a, um, platform turns into a world beater. Um, mm. you know, that's the promise that the, the, the software offers, but getting an objective assessment when anyone who's in a decision-making role lacks the technical skills and the software is so complex and large now that no individual human being actually understands, um, the totality of it. No. Um, what was it the first, the last uh, handmade uh, computer chip was put together in 1986 or something like that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, obviously they've gotten a lot better <laughs> since then, but um, it's 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 just problematic when instead of saying here's something that works and is known to work and we will buy it off the shelf from these other people and they will promise to support it. Mm. Uh, and to then it's being... got integrated in with these other seven uh, applications that come from all these uh, these other countries. Yeah, well, that's where things go horribly wrong. Mm. Yeah, um, between and... the Israelis, the Belgium, the French, the Germans, and I think there was somebody else in there that one of their other systems they had. Uh, yeah, um, it, it, it's really hard. And as, as you know, anyone... what, what, what uh, backdoors the Israelis are putting into there, whatever they're selling. Well, there's there's that, but as well as that, you know, when something goes wrong and you've got all these systems from different manufacturers interacting with each other. No one will ever take responsibility. They'll all point instinctively, the like... first thing they'll do when they're told there's a problem is point the finger at the other guys. Yep. Uh, now, I'd just like to point out another thing with um, having these other countries provide the uh, certain a- aspects for the tank that um, the one, it limits your spares, which is the whole point of going to indigenous capabilities is to not be reliant upon other countries. But where they are, and there are certain uh, parts of the tank that they are relying on, on overseas countries uh, and companies, those companies are looking to do their production run for the Mark 1s and the Mark 1As, and then that's it. They're going to close up shop. So that's really going to limit your uh, ability to have spares into, or support into the future. Um, so I mean, I'm not saying it's for all of them, but there are. Uh, um, I remember noticing there was, there was some countries that are saying, yep, 
we'll support you for this run and then we're done thanks guys we're just going to take the money and retire to wherever yeah it's, but this is the problem when your development process is so incredibly glacially slow and long is that yeah um, lots of businesses decide this isn't something they want to be involved in anymore I mean even India has decided that um, the Mark 1A is going to be the last production run for the Arduin. So they've said uh, after after they've made this next 118 tanks um, of the Mark 1As, they're going to shut that production line down and they're not going to run that anymore. They're going to build, move on to making their uh, possibly their LBTs, their light battle tanks. So again, they're going to severely limit your ability to maintain and uh, produce spares and support over the lifetime of, uh, of these tanks. I think for India, at least in the foreseeable future, focusing on a light-ish tank, mm-hmm. let's, let's say you start with a 20-ton design and then it gains 10 tons in development. They're, they're, they're after 15... They're starting at, starting at 15 tons. Yeah, okay. Well, okay, let's let's just say it picks up another 10 tons once mm-hmm. you put the active protection system on mm-hmm. it and, um, and the rest of it. Um, yeah, that that means you hit an end point that can actually cross some bridges in uh, northern India. Mm. Anyway, we're going to pause here, go okay. grab beer, mm. and talk about that for a minute, and then we're going to come back with more fun stuff about the Arjun because there's a little, still more to talk about. More to talk about. My God, wow! This is going to be a bumper edition. So now it's time, Rob, for Beer, Beer Review. Review. Now. This ain't no Graga Rail. One pint down, you'll be swinging in the gale. Five pints, bully, you'll be shaking in your shoes. Hang on a sec, hang on a sec. I'm gonna get the sound. Hmm, that was a bit disappointing. Okay. <laughs> it smells lovely. The beer we have today is Kingfisher. Mm. Which is... The least imaginative choice of an Indian beer, but the one I could find. Yes, it okay. is actually <laughs> it is actually an Indian beer, mm-hmm. even if it was brewed in New Zealand and imported to Australia. Mm. It's still brewed under license. license. Mm. Under license is an important yes. thing. Yeah. Um, so so uh, of, it was funny. We we do have a lot of Indian. Well, we had a lot of Indian fans of this podcast, <laughs> um, and when they discovered we were doing the Arjun. Um, Quite a few of them, I was asking, actually asking them for if they could give us some inside opinion, and they were all just got really coy, and were like, oh, no, we want to hear what you have to say about it, uh, which wasn't very helpful, and um, then there was a lot of concern that we'd stuffed the beer up again, um, but they were all like, come on, at least Kingfisher, so we've, we've achieved... The bare minimum, just <laughs> like the Arjun. <laughs> I was looking for the Taj Mahal, but uh, mm. I, uh, all I could find in my in three places I went to was Kingfisher. Three I, places? Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, I make, I make an effort, all right? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so it was the bare minimum I could do, and I found it, and even then it was, uh, there was none in the actual uh, fridges. It was uh, a box tucked away. Uh, they had actually just gotten a new shipment in sitting on the floor, but uh, yeah, so... That was that was the main thing. I got it. So, premium lager beer since eighteen fifty seven. Serve cool, the finest malted barley and hops. The king of good times, Kingfisher. Eh? Look, this is it, it's a global lager. It is. Um, it's largely indistinguishable from Carlsberg or dare I say it, Foster's. I was about to um, say. I'm assuming this is the, the the Indian version of Foster's, whereby yeah. it's what other people see as an Indian beer, and uh, nobody in India actually drinks it. But I don't yeah, know. Or, or or Heineken or Qingdao from China. Um, it's probably no one from that country's favourite beer, or very few people. Mm. Um, but you can get Kingfisher in most Indian restaurants in the world. Um, and, um, as our friends from Red Dwarf says, nothing kills a vindaloo like a lager. Um, and, um, Kingfisher is the the dwarf. (laughs) Kingfisher is the lager of choice, um, for that. And, um, it's got everything you want in a, um, premium lager. It's almost... It, it, it's urine coloured. Let's let's not beat around the bush. It, no, uh, it is definitely that uh, lovely, <laughs> lovely yellow fla- colour of beer. Yeah, um, um, you know, it's like that old joke about you know the, the, you you just rent the beer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a three thirty mil bottle. It's five percent alcohol, so it's one point three standard drinks. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with it. Very pretty kingfish. It's got a beautiful lager nose, though. That's slightly sulphury. Um, 
smell that just you breathe in as you're taking that sip and mm. um kingfisher like the uh, kookaburras but are both raptors i don't know those kookaburras are kingfishers are kingfishers yeah oh. do they eat f- uh fish though well they mostly eat lizards but if they That's can what... find fish they'll eat them yes there you go. I, d- mm. I don't know if kookaburras actually dive into the water or not uh, I don't know, but I'm ninety nine percent sure that they are part of the kingfisher family. Well, they're part of the raptor family, yeah, which is the both are, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, they've been the birds. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's particularly part. Of okay. It's called raptors. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, there you go. So, uh, kingfisher beer. Yes, it is beer. We're going to drink this beer. Yummy, mm. yummy beer. Look, obviously, it is mostly served with um, Indian food in Indian restaurants. Um, I could happily drink this all night long while munching into a whole bunch of curries. I could also drink it all night long in lots of other settings. Um, it's my one criticism, and it's not even a criticism, is just that it is largely indistinguishable from every other global lager. Yeah, and it's priced the same. So I think yeah. it's 17 bucks for a six pack, which is not bad. Yeah. Let's try a treat for a six pack. So yeah, it's cheaper than you pay for locally made craft beer. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So Kingfisher, it's good. Um, you, you will enjoy it if you like beer in general. Yes. So, uh, now we, d- we did have a listener, um, having a go at us. Um, uh, we, as our listenership has grown, we have more have listeners having a go at us, uh, <laughs> about the fact that we were reviewing too many IPAs because IPAs are dime a dozen and, um, done to death and totally overexposed. And I did point out that 80% of the um, world's beer consumption is lagers, and that didn't um, calm them down at all. Because um, if you're in certain corners of the of America or even here in Australia where craft beer is a bigger thing, then yeah, there's, there's a lot of IPAs and the style is probably overexposed in those settings. But for the broader community who mostly just drink lagers all the time, it's a bit like people who can tell the difference between Coke variants. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, I don't like that Pepsi. I like the Coke. And, you know, if all you ever drink is those really, um, particularly where the flavor is always exactly the same and they're very similar, you can actually tell the difference. But if you start expanding your palate into the wider world of things and it's like, well, this this niche is just mm. the same thing. Um, now, because yeah. I couldn't find this initially, I was looking at a Northeast India parallel because, well, Indian, but um, no, no. <laughs> it no. was not. I oh, know, which is no. why I'm glad I did manage to find I think, I think, a, 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 a box yeah. of uh, Kingfisher to uh, bring home. There is there is an interesting little move going on in the industry to uh, rename it. No, to, to stop calling IPAs IPAs, which stands for India Pale Ale, which mm. was based on what the English were doing in the 19th century. Mm. Um, with using spare shipping allocations Probably of from offices. Probably about 1857? Uh, yeah, possibly <laughs> around then. Anyway, so they, they were shipping beer to India and back because um, junior officers were given five tonnes of shipping allocation and not all junior officers had five tonnes of stuff they wanted to ship to India and back. Um, and um, the end result was beer was getting sent over, not sold, getting sent back, and then they were drinking it after a year. Um, and they were brewing it stronger. And so it's kind of where the India Pale Ale in theory comes from but they're, they're fundamentally not the same beer at all um and so in central europe they just call them ippers because they look at the label saying ipa and just call them ippers um and a lot of um people who think do beer scholarship are saying maybe the central europeans onto something we should just call them ippers and take out the the india thing mm. and um i mean indians make this... it a brand rather than a uh, than a yeah uh, uh, an acronym yeah, and Indians um, <clears throat> will be pleased at least that India in beer brewing terms has become a, uh, synonymous with strong, um, which is nice. There you go. I mean, I'd, go. I'd like that about my country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so that's that's something on that. Anyway, Rob, you, you've got more to say about the Arjun before we turn our thoughts to other matters? Yes. Okay. So All right. the logistics of the Arjun, it is, and the, and the Mark 1 and the Mark 1 uh, one eight. 1A. Yeah, and so, every problem the Mark 1 has with logistics, the Mark 1A makes worse. Yes. Mm. So, the size of the Mark, uh, both tanks is too big for their trains. And so, what they, um, so they can't put, so to move these things around, they can't put them on trains because the rail lines within India are built to a certain standard. And if they roll them through stations on the back of their rolling stock, they uh, rip half the station out of uh, out of it, which has actually happened with the Mark 1s. Now, so in, in, in train terms, this gets called the template. 
and um, your, your, your load has to fit within the template yep. or it starts now firstly there's the uh, furniture in the um, along the um, train lines and in the train stations and that's bad but there's also when your train goes past another train going the other way if you don't fit in the template a lot of really bad things happen <laughs> at very high speed. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I don't think when they were building the uh, state, the train stations within India, India, they were really thinking about the uh, template of your uh, uh, of a domestic main battle tank yeah. in twenty twenty one. That was yeah. not what the British engineers were thinking about back then at all. <laughs> no, uh, so you've got that. All right, um, uh, it's also the the Mark ones can be lifted by their IL-76 transport aircraft, one of them, mm-hmm. but the Mark 1As mm-hmm. can't. So they have mm-hmm. to buy, go out and buy some a bunch of C-17 Globemasters to be able to airlift one of Look, those things. Everyone, and they're doing that. They're doing ev- that. Everyone needs C-17s. They're the best transport plane in the last... Since, but, since the C-130. Yeah, but the point, point being is if the IL-76 could do... What, a 60 ton tank mm-hmm. but it can't do the 68 ton tank mm-hmm. and you're having to buy, go out and buy a whole new uh, aircraft fleet for and it and if you're in the army you're saying why don't we just buy more T-90s that only weigh 28 tons uh, we can fit two we'll of those in the we'll aisle. we'll get to that we'll get to that <laughs> <laughs> right. and it has a bigger gun and better armour and it's faster <laughs> we'll get to that alright so they've also had to, because it can't go on the trains um, and it can't go on the planes so they've got to go out and buy new planes they also can't go on the back of trucks, so they're going out to buy new low-loader trucks to put these things on the back of. Still has to fit over the bridge, though. Still has to fit over the bridge. All the bridges, of course, rated to about 50 tonnes. Mm-hmm. And uh, the army, of basically, when people said, oh, why don't we just go out and uh, all the, the areas where we think the conflict is going to happen, why don't we go out and strengthen those, the culverts and uh, the bridges in those areas? So that Well, that does give a lot of intelligence to your enemy. But, and the army's just turned around and said, why are we going to bother doing that, spend billions of dollars doing that when we could just run the T-90s and T-72s over them because they mm. fit? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I would also and, say and that... the Army basically said, no, we're not doing that yeah. because there's absolutely no point. So that's why they're stuck in Rajasthan. But with being stuck there... But, but if I was Pakistani intelligence, it would be a very simple thing to keep track of where the culverts are getting strengthened and there's a sign that's where the attack's coming from. <laughs> Only from the Arjuns, which yeah. are, of which you know there are 120. Yeah. Are uh, you going to sure. worry about them okay. or, the, well, or the or the 2,000 T-72s that could be coming over the other road that isn't? Yeah, but I, yeah, I hear you, but this is kind of the, the problem that, it, you know, you've got to imagine it for a tank, what if this was the standard? And the, if it was the standard, that it only creates more problems, um, which is why you say, no, let's not do this thing. Mm. Uh, um, okay, so they're only st- stationed in uh, Rajasthan, mm. um, which means the crews... Mm. there's no rotation of the crews because they're always stuck there they're trained on these tanks and Indians do deployment for life it's kind of part of you know it's like the, the Indian Navy if you get um, if you know how to work the engines of one ship you are just going to be working those engines forever <laughs> <laughs> that might have been the case but I think uh, but they are saying they're having uh, uh, staffing issues by because the troops are only deployed there's one area and they, there's no rotation they they are stuck there yeah look, I, th- I think if you you know get assigned a, to the Arjun Battalion you know you've done something wrong <laughs> but they should, <laughs> but you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be seen as the <laughs> it should be seen as the Guards Brigade not the <laughs> They should just rename them uh, <laughs> rather than the 40s, 73rd or whatever regiment, tank regiment. Mm. It should be the guards regiment. I don't know. Mm, uh, you have to pay them more. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, what else was I going to say? Look, 2017, having gone out and uh, uh, they're still... In 2017, they were still dickering. Uh, the Indian Army was still dickering over whether or not they wanted to get a new version of the... Arjun. And so the discussion as to whether or not they're going to sign the contract for the Mark 1As uh, has been going on since then. And it only got signed off in September 2021. So two month, three months ago. Whenever oh, yeah. um, two months ago. Uh, at the same time, in 2017, the Army has gone out with a request for uh, intent for 1,700 MBTs to replace their T-72s. Mm. Now, do you think they're going to do that with T-90s? Quite possibly. Mm. But yeah. the point being is that they're not banking on the Arjun 
filling that role of the T-72s. They're, no, it's got a terrible engine, the wrong gun and armour that might not work. They're banking it, they're going out and saying, all right, who else can we buy these things from? And it's probably, mm. it's probably going to be uh, upgraded T-90s, but the fact that they're making those decisions at the same time, they're saying, yep, we're not, we don't want to buy these things, we're not signing that contract for another four years until all the... Um, all the, the ducks line up that, the, that they want to have but at the same time. and But they're saying, yep, we're going to go out and we're going to buy 1,700 new tanks over some stage. Um, even the development of having signed this contract for the Mark 1As, they're going to get five prototypes, hang on, uh, five to be built by 2025, is that right? And then 30 a year until they've all done by 2030. I might have some dates wrong there. Apologies for that if that is mm. incorrect. But yeah, it's not going to be quick. It's not going to be... Uh, um, they're not going to be replacing the Arjuns anytime quickly. And as I said, they're not... They're going to... Once the capability is... Uh, the production is built, they're not running it any further than that. At the same time, I want to point out that in 2012, at a... They decided they needed a new uh, self-propelled gun. Mm. So they went out and said, right, what's the self-propelled guns going around here? The K9, um, uh, I think it's Panther or something? No, mm. well, it's Korean version of K9, a uh, self-propelled gun. So yeah. the, um, the Indians said, right, we're going to have that. And they've gone onto a license and they're making their own uh, K9 Badgers, mm. Badgers um, self-propelled guns with uh, South Korea. Since 2012, they've already delivered 100 of those this year, so in 2021. So having decided they're going to build them, uh, purchase them and build them, un- build them under license again from 20- 2012, nine years later, they've got 100 of these things rolled out. It seems to me that India is really good at building things under license, but hasn't been as effective as building things from scratch. Now, you've got to take some actions from that and say, what are our strengths here? And what are our proven weaknesses? And say, why are we going? Why would we go keep going down this path when we're really good at? You lean into your strengths. The whole point of your strengths is you lean into them. Yeah, I I got a suspicion, um, and one of our listeners pointed out that the reason why the British have um, gone for Challenger Three, even with its ludicrously low production run, is that you have to have an indigenous tank building capability to participate in the next um, German French. Uh, combined tank program and the Indians have probably got just enough with the Arjun to possibly get in on that action and that would make a lot more sense than a lot of other things about this there you go look that's uh, something I hadn't thought of and that's a good point if that if that's the if you need to meet that criteria um Mm. And that, that would certainly explain why in 2021 they've just placed an order for them I I would also say though that the tank production line is a totally different beast to the tank design bureau. Yep. Um, and obviously their production line stuff, given that they've been building T-72s under license that they're happy with and that they've been able to get... Because, I mean, doing a Korean-Indian um, uh, technology exchange is extremely hard because English is the only you know, common language and you're, um, you know, moving you know, essentially through three languages to do all your stuff. Um, and if that's working well, then obviously... They can set up um, production lines and make them work, and that that's great. And I would say that the design bureau side of things is a hard skill to have and a very hard skill to maintain because you've got to keep um, teams of hundreds of people occupied, even if they're just doing drawings. You know, designs that are never going to get built. They still need to be um, well, there, kept there are, busy. There are new designs going to be built though. So that's mm. what I'm talking about the light battle tank. Um, yeah. Uh, which will, which they believe will be based upon the chassis of the K9. So again, mm. uh, and that's what the production run after the Arjun will be going into building those. Um, again, this is that hasn't been confirmed yet. hasn't they haven't sent off the uh, set off the uh, written their contracts yet or anything like that. But they're looking for a light battle tank that they can get up into uh, the mountains uh, with the border for on China. Um, because, yeah, there's no way an Arjun's getting up there. And Well, the, the, the Sianchen Glacier is a phenomenally hard place to engage in military operations, and they had a lot of fights up there. That's why um, people are basically walking up there and then uh, hitting each other with sticks. Yeah, because... <laughs> they can't carry anything heavier. Um, yeah, and, and helicopters don't fly that high. No. Um, it's no. uh, it's a really tough environment, and you're... Um, 
your supercharger on your um, diesel engine better be have a really big blower because there's not a lot of air to work with. No, um. and that's that's <laughs> one of the reasons. Well, there's a couple of reasons why the T72s and the T90s won't work at that altitude. So the Chinese have got their T15s, Type 15s. Okay, I thought they were on t- Type 90s. No, no, but, T90s, but, but, but no, yeah. these are the ones, they're, they're, they're the light tanks they've oh, designed Oh, especially for. built for the fighting on the glaciers. Yes. Yeah. So, and the, whereas the T72s and the T90s, yes, won't work at altitude because of lack of air. Mm. Uh, also, um, uh, I f- was reading about how with the um, weight, the greater weight at the rear of the tank, they can't actually climb hills as well because you're losing your front traction. Oh, oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, and again, that's a, uh, one of the things that the K9 actually couple does of, better. A couple of blocks of concrete up on the front. And, <laughs> the uh... K9 does better because it has a heavier front load and so it can actually climb uh, um, altitude, uh, at altitude better. I just want to explain something for people who haven't thought about the Indian landmass um, very much, was that, which is that basically the whole north of India is occupied by the um, Himalayas, the highest mountain mountains in the world um and uh and and this is why high altitude warfare is such an issue that indians need to think about um and you know the, a bit of the pakistani border and particularly where they have conflict um is is up at these extremely high altitudes up over ten thousand feet and um where, where the i think it's the pakistanis are higher up but they've got the smaller guns and the indians are lower down on the altitude but they've got the bigger guns and so you've got the uh, basically what was the computer well, the shells yet? does that meet in the middle yeah, yeah. pretty much there's, there's comparable uh, mm-hmm. activity uh, worms yeah <laughs> yeah uh and um and and then, then you've got you know the the chinese tibetan border um being a, a huge um you know uh, shared border that they you know i mean they have fights over just building roads because, you know, there's... As soon as um, you build a road up there, then you can get more stuff in. You get and more stuff in, And yeah. then you can start having a strategic advantage and then uh, it becomes control of the water and which way the uh, the rivers are flowing and who's got mm. control of that water and which way, uh, what you're going to do with it. And, yeah. uh, and it gets very complicated because you've got disputed borders, you've got f- effective lines of control and they are not the same thing at all. And uh, you've got retreating glaciers, which is changing the landscape. Landscape, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, oh... That valley is uh, a lot longer than it used to be. and uh... Now, I, I'm not going to try and arbitrate between the Indians and the Chinese over whose claims are <laughs> right and wrong. Uh, but certainly this, this is an area of um, significant conflict. And if you can get your tank um, to the fight in those conditions, you're going to have an advantage over those who can't. Mm. So, yeah. Which is, yeah. Um, uh, look, this uh, was such a huge, difficult terrain differences between... The heat of the deserts, the plains and canals and swamps of the uh, Punjab. Ooh, that reminds me. Just one thing I did want to talk about. I love the camouflage scheme on this tank. Yep, that's very cool. The uh, so you've got the, the this sandy color for the the, the the deserts and the plains, and this electric green of the jungle. Uh, I don't know how well this actually functions as camouflage, but it looks really cool, really different. Um, style points chalk that up as a win. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to, before we go into that, uh, one more thing with the cost of the tank. So with the Mark 1A, is going to be costing almost $10 million. To put it in perspective, you've got the uh, T-72 is going for about $1.5 million these days, and then your T-90 is even going for about $2.5 million. So mm. you're really thinking uh, there's got to be uh, some good reasons. And look, you're uh, uh, ticking the box for saying, yep, we have an indigenous tank capability, so can we come play with the... Um, uh, Leclerc um, Leopard 3 combination building mm. activities later in the next five years. That might be pretty much it. Um, I want to bring this back around to an Australian perspective Ooh. of 120 tanks, 120 Arjuns uh-huh. would not be good for Australia. Because no, they're be not the good o- for anywhere, really. But, but it, it's the only, it'd be the only 120 tanks we have. But for mm. India... 120 Arjuns is fine because you backed up by 2,000 T72s. So yeah, but you it's then a gotta, good it's a good bad tank to have if you have 3,000 other tanks. <laughs> yes, if you have so many other tanks that they are but a drop in the ocean and no one will ever notice that they're not that great, um, then I guess they're okay. Um, I think the 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 weight is the absolute killer that that you can get so much better tank and. While the, the, the Challenger 3 and the new uh, 
Abrams will be going up to uh, the same or higher, and even the Leopard 3s will be looking mm. at high, uh, a higher weight. Um, they're probably designed to be operating in environments uh, for Western Europe environments so where... Well, they've got 100-ton bridges. Yeah, exactly. They've mm. already designed that sort of stuff, whereas uh, uh, in the um, areas within pa- uh, India and Pakistan and China that uh, these things uh, hopefully never have to operate... Um, probably don't have the infrastructure to support that. But I would also say that particularly in up on the glaciers, um, any 100-ton bridges are going to disappear on the first day of war. <laughs> yes. that, that's an easy target yeah. list. Yeah. <laughs> bridges don't, aren't known for moving very much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, all of the bridges are going to be on the target list, but the bridges that can actually um, take heavy armour are yeah. going to really be in your um, you know, on your list. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Any we, more on the Arjun Rob? No, but I think we're going to pause for two secs and then come okay. back with some other fun stuff. Russians with hats. 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 So, Rob, what do, what do we need to talk about now? Russians with hats. Russians with hats. Um, possibly a good name for a band. Um, <laughs> possibly an album, if only we had musical talent. Um, <laughs> None of that. So, the, um, the Russians are massing on the Ukrainian border, which is... Um, Alarming for everybody. Yeah, uh, quite a thing. Um, the Russian experts I've heard talking about this think that the build-up isn't ready for an invasion and they won't have the bits in places until February. And um, you wouldn't have thought that even the Russians would want to launch an offensive um, in February. Through the mud. Through the mud and the um, freezing snow. Well, they might say it's uh, February is still going to be frozen over and they can run, the, run them over in five days and uh, be done. Um, I, well, the, uh, the, the, the issue then becomes that, you know, if, if you've got a target of February, then you might actually hit it in March and then you're dealing with a spring offensive. Mm. Um Although, yeah, March is a little early, but, you know, heading towards April. Anyway, point is, Russians are massing troops on the Ukrainian border. They have been seen to have put hats hats on their tanks. Um, So what we're talking about is slatted armour, but basically they they look like um, pergolas. Yeah, basically they've taken some star pickets, welded them to the side of their turrets, put some uh, corrugated iron over the top and said, Mm. we've got a hat on. Got a hat on. Now, the reason for this is obviously that more and more uh, munitions, uh, anti-tank munitions... I've gotten smarter uh, and going for top-down... Top attacks, a, top, yep. Top-down approaches, and Which, because the top of your turret is very thin. Thin, line. yeah, because you don't want to put weight up there if you can avoid it. Um, now I've got some issues with this, which is that something like the Javelin, um, which is quite a smart munition, and that does the pop-up that they're particularly thinking of... Um, if, if a munition's smart enough to do a pop-up attack, you can probably also retime the fuse to not go off when it hits the hat and to still um, hold on until it's in contact with the main tank. But the, the Russian trooper on the tank is probably saying to himself, okay, I've seen these things, so I don't like it, so what can I do about it? Mm. And he's, he's, because there, there's no standard approach to the photos you've seen. They're all a little bit, little bit different. Um, so it's obviously something that's gone around... Um, the uh, the Russian Instagram tanker's mm. Instagram feed, and, so, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they decided Probably to put. TikTok. But yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, it, it's it, I mean, they're doing it a lot. So you have got your hillbilly armor, which let's face it, you know, we saw how the American forces in Iraq um, adapted to um, IEDs and shape charges mm. with um, their own um, improvised armor. Uh, it's interesting in terms of, you know, at, at sea pop-up attacks have been a thing they've been worried about for a bit longer. Um, and I will constantly say that tank development and naval development do have consistent parallels and they tend to do it first at sea. Uh, top attack munitions or pop-up attack munitions uh, can have an advantage, but they do make themselves much more vulnerable. And um, it, uh, the, usually they'll pop up at the last minute though yeah but the, uh, but during the pop-up phase if you're close in weapon system um mm. or in the case of a tank and active protection system is kind of being given a second bite at the cherry while your missile um comes out of the horizontal into the vertical mm. and then flips over back into the um the vertical and so if you do have some sort of um hopefully automated um defense system a pop-up attack can um lose you the engagement Whereas um, if you just go in as fast as you can at the side, um, that that has a lot of merit to it as well. The thing is, if you can't see your target clearly, I mean, which is the case for a lot of tanks, because they're happening at one and a half, two, com- two yeah. kilometres, mm-hmm. um, then 
top uh, pop-up attacks, doesn't matter which way the tank is facing. If you're hitting it from the front, rear, or side, it's going to hit the top. Um, where you're not worried whether or not it's going to hit the thin rear armor, the uh, uh, or the side armor, or hit smack dab in the um, which if you're going straight in. You mm. don't know unless you've got a good at target picture of uh, what you're hitting. Yeah, I think Murphy's Law works for you on this one in that the tank is always facing towards you. Um, mm. But um, I, 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 I take your point, and most tanks since even late in World War II, the front glasses is functionally impenetrable uh, to most weapons you're going to have. And if mm. you have better weapons, the glasses gets better. Yeah. Um, so it, then it becomes, how do you get around the um, the sides, the back, or, or in this case, the top? Uh, it's an interesting evolution, um, but I think there'll be a lot more cat and mouse with the, um, the armor weaponry mm. um, change. And I think while pop-ups might have um, some benefit right here and now, and certainly the last um, Azerbaijani war showed that um, even drones with um, quite small warheads were um, wreaking havoc on tanks. Um, the long-term answer is probably going to be better automated defense systems on tanks to take out small things flying through the air. Which is, and going back to your warships comparison, uh, the way to defeat all that, do you close in weapon systems, is, of course, is to launch three missiles at it. One from... One straight, one dog leg right, one dog leg, dog leg left. Sure, you overwhelm make, the systems, overwhelm yeah. Overwhelm the system, system, and that's what you can do to tanks if they've got that sort of thing. But but it's it's then it's can, very hard to overwhelm to saturate a, a system compared to being able to just get one shot in and, and yeah. make it work. Yeah, uh, and speaking of the uh, the systems that uh, the Ukrainians have been purchasing and are being given uh, by the U.S. military, more of these um, uh, anti tank guided missiles, and that's why. The Russians are making this um, uh, effort of putting their hats on uh, because basically they can see the uh, yeah the other guys are preparing for us to come across with uh, by buying up more of these missiles and uh, launcher systems and so what are we going to do to combat that now hopefully all this doesn't become a thing I'm really hopeful for that because um, with Biden calling uh, um, Putin on what is it Tuesday or whatever else that's mm. supposed to be so, sorting out say please don't do this <laughs> peace in our times hopefully <sighs> look I mean I don't, I'm not going to get into the politics of that but uh, hopefully, hopefully yeah I I wouldn't have a lot of confidence um, if I was putting Putin in a room as my guy against sorry if I was putting Biden in the room as my guy against Putin who's a stone cold killer and, um, and what's Biden got to win from supporting Ukraine as realistically what the Americans are going to look at. Look, I, I have heard a theory that this has actually been prompted by the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline coming online, because uh, up until now the Russians needed um, Ukraine to transport their gas, and um, now they've got an alternative. Um, but then it's like, what are the Russians actually going to gain from... Because wars are... Even in the coldest analysis, unbelievably expensive. Mm. Um, and then you've got the issue of you are messing up the lives of um, all of the soldiers involved and all the civilians um, that happen to be around it. And you, you just ask, aside from sheer revenge on uh, the current Ukrainian government from um, ratting out the Russians a few years ago, I just don't actually see... You might want to have to send a message to uh, other parts of the Russian near abroad that if you rat us out, we will mess you up. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, it's Sopranos rules is, um, as good an explanation of geopolitics as any. Um, yep. No, so now we, along with this is, uh, Poland at the beginning of the year, uh, did their own war gaming exercises and they were saying, right, if the Russians, uh, take Ukraine and they start rolling through Belarus, uh, we need to be able to hold them out for 22 days before the political pressure comes on them to uh, stop. Uh, any sort of activity. political pressure and the American reinforcements, yeah. but all yeah. that sort of stuff. Mm. I was, um, and they found that after doing their war games, that uh, they only, they only lasted five days, and they all said, "Oh shit, we're not very good at this." Mm. So they've take they're taking a step of doubling their uh, their military. Um, now, I mean, th th there's a few things to unpack there. For, mm. Firstly, is obviously um, Poland has a very painful history of um, other people. Trying to driving through their country, yeah, to... trying to resist foreign invaders, mm. uh, and I uh, have an immense amount of sympathy for the Poles in in the reasonably robust way they've gone about um, their defence policy to try mm. and uh, make sure it doesn't happen to them again. 
if I am an army that is trying to get more funding, um, holding a war game and, and then leaking the results and then leaking the results is a good way to go about getting but the funding you're after. Doubling the size of your military is a huge, huge, huge effort. So, and look, it's going along with their, the nationalistic tendencies that the, the um, politics of their country is going is going through at the moment. But it is something that, um, again, you're looking at an arms race in a, an area because they share. They're worried about their shared border with uh, Belarus, mm-hmm. um, and so what's going to happen there? So it is all very messy, getting messy up on up, up on that area. So, again, hopefully. Um, these things all cool heads will prevail and um, things will turn out okay yeah certainly you know it wasn't that long ago people were trying to tell us that the Russians were a declining power and that their the demographics were against them and they um... well they've started reinvesting in their tanks and uh, said well what are we good at uh, taking over places mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I and seeing seeing whether or not the uh, anybody's going to respond mm. Um, certainly, I, I, if I was the Russians, I would be viewing America as a, um, wounded power and vulnerable to, um, to aggression at this moment. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and, for, you know, I also, you know, fundamentally what, what do the Americans stand to gain by continuing to expend all this, um, treasure, um, in Eastern European politics? Um, I I would be saying let's um not spend this money there and possibly these lives and possibly risking um you know nuclear um mm-hmm. warfare um when when the, the the poles need to and the and the Ukrainians need to um, reach some sort of um you know uh, agreement with the Russians about where their their their, their boundaries stand. Uh, you know, having said that, that you then get the argument about you know what why do appeasement? Why you've got to stand up to it early and. I get that, but I, I don't think Putin is Hitler. Um, and I don't think Russia actually wants to... Definitely wants to be secure from Western aggression. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, we in the West tend to forget that we literally did invade Russia in 1919 um, with, with very significant numbers of troops. I also have a big uh, cultural invasion of uh, pretty much everywhere in the world. Yeah, and, and also the, the, the post-Soviet collapse, the, the installation of the, um, the, the oligarchs through the Western banking system, that killed millions of Russians. And uh, probably Vladimir Putin more than anyone is... Um, aware, very... of, aware of his position because of that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and also not not happy about the carnage that was wreaked by the um, the, the financial order. Uh, so yeah, it's a um, a tough one. Um, the, now but... we're going to finish off on a slightly lighter note. Okay, a lighter note. Yes, <laughs> we, this is where we talk about COVID vaccines, Rob. No, no, oh, right. slipped and okay. fell, John. Slipped and fell. Right. The... Ah, yes. <laughs> So, and, and this story is one of these stories that can only come from Gloucester uh, or, or Gloucestershire in, in, in the U, the British West Country. And if you've ever been to Gloucestershire, you'll know why it could only come from there. And I guess if you haven't, then this is a bit mysterious. But a, a gentleman turned up at the emergency department. And I mean, the Sun had a beautiful headline of send in the bum squad because apparently... He slipped and fell. He had slipped and fallen while perusing his collection of artillery ammunition. And the ammunition had lodged itself in his bum. Um, and uh, then he'd gone to hospital and then the the, uh, the, the bomb squad had uh, been required to come and... Um, <laughs> attend the attend the device. Deal with this 57 millimeter shell up this guy's ass. And uh, I, I just... I don't, I don't know what part of your training. He was uh, he was, he was, he was cleaning his uh, military uh, military uh, memorabilia, and uh, whilst showering, and then slipped. No, I don't know. There was no mention about showering, but he slipped and fell, and yep, up it went. And so the, now, the hospital was able to take it out without uh, harm, and then the bomb squad, yep, said it was uh, inert, uh, but they had to be called in and to secure the. Um, the, uh, the device. Now, th- this does remind me, when I lived in London, I had a New Zealand <laughs> housemate who was, she was a nurse, and um, her dad um, is a collector of militaria, and she had told me that he had a working Bofors gun, which he would occasionally take pot shots at passing aircraft with. Um, and, uh, in New Zealand? 
Yeah, this was oh, in. Good. Yeah, yeah. He was in New Zealand. I bet he had a uh, universal carrier as well. Oh, possibly. Uh, but anyway, so she was in London, um, sharing an apartment with me, and um, one day the phone rang, and this was still in the days when landlines were a thing, and I was home and picked up the phone, and this um, Eastern European voice was saying, "I have the grenades; they are ready," <laughs> because. <laughs> My housemate was uh, facilitating her dad's military purchases. <laughs> uh, and I, I figure it was someone like that who was... Um, this, this, this is the mid-90s and so yeah. Yeah, the, the, the walls come down. There's uh, This is all the... <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, you know, the, I, I, I have a huge problem with collecting ammunition um, in that the stuff as it ages um, only becomes more and more dangerous to everyone around it and is non-functional and uh while i would normally encourage everyone to do whatever floats their boat um a a don't don't don't, don't don't stick it up your bum and b um don't um have uh, live explosives in things you keep in your house don't kick mortar tails is the saying (laughs) just because it's sticking out of the ground doesn't mean you kick it (laughs) that's that's doubly pertinent in um, All right, but we are going to finish up by saying for those who have access to the vaccines for COVID-19, please, please, please go and get them. I'm off to get my booster shot tomorrow. I'm getting my third. There you go. For those who don't yet have access, we feel... um, uh, We hope that soon you'll have access and that uh, you'll be able to live in the 98% vaccinated status that we are here in Canberra. Um, Mm. But uh, for those who have access, please, please, please go get vaccinated. Mm. And we'll... uh... We, we might sneak out another episode this year where we'll deal with our correspondence from the year um, in the style of Robert Maxwell. and um, But otherwise, we might be back in January. Mm. Happy okay. Day. All right. Take care, all. It's been a long one. Thank you, folks, for listening. We will be back in your ears soon. Mm.